Hello there, and welcome to the first episode of The Punch Show. Uh, my name's Kelly Scaletta, and some of you probably know me better as Machine Pun Kelly from Twitter, and uh, trying to build up a little presence here on YouTube. So thanks for watching, and if you like what I have to say, go ahead and just punch that subscribe button for me, and if you don't, punch it anyway. Anyway, um, today I wanted to talk about uh, this the, uh, bias in the media, because we, we talked a lot about how the media has a liberal bias, but um, I actually disagree <laughs> and think that we have what is becoming more and more a very, very conservative bias, uh, and uh let me explain what I mean by that. The, uh, the definition of bias is a prejudice in favor of or against one thing, person, or group compared with another, usually in a way considered to be unfair. Uh, we confuse this with having an opinion or uh, a, a viewpoint that's based on actual substance, actual reality, actual facts, or actual morality. Um, and one example of this that I think most people wouldn't argue with, except for maybe Mark Robinson, is that slavery is bad, right? Most of us now agree slavery, bad. You should not be allowed to own other people. I don't have an anti-slavery bias I have a moral position based on the fact that I think that owning other people is wrong. And I and so so this is not a bias to say slavery is bad. We shouldn't like go halfway and say, well, some slavery is bad, but you know, not all slavery is bad. Uh, you know, maybe uh, we can meet in the middle on indentured servitude or something. Uh, th this is all just ridiculous, right? To, to try and find the middle ground on slavery. But what's happened is that the, the right has moved the Overton window so far that the media is always trying to find the center of the Overton window. You know, because to them, that's a lack of bias. But that center moves to the right the further the right wing moves to the right. So now we're in a position where there's actually a pro-right bias because the media is trying to be unbiased. They're, they're so unbiased that they're actually biased. Uh, there is a point where you just report the facts. And if the facts are biased, quote unquote, then that's how you report it without being biased. Um, There's also, you know, something called a leaning. It's it's not that you can't have an opinion. It's just that the opinion needs to be based on facts. It needs to be based on substance. It needs to be based on reality. And if those facts, if that reality has a liberal bias, then that just means reality has a liberal bias. So let me give you some examples of what I'm talking about. Uh, the first one is just, let's just talk about the expectations for both Donald Trump and Kamala Harris. Um, they, they are not on the same level. They're applying for the same job. But because Donald Trump wasn't a political person since he came down the escalator, he's always been given a higher floor uh, than anybody else. Anything he says, he, he's, he, anything stupid he says is dismissed because he doesn't have the political history and, you know, it just doesn't make sense. It's like if, if two people are applying for a heart surgeon's job and one of them says that the heart is the same thing as the kidney and has never been to medical school, 
We don't say, well, that's okay that he doesn't know the difference between a heart and a kidney because he's never been to medical school. And then the other person, you know, gets one little tiny thing wrong about some, you know, nuance of atrial fi uh, fibrillation or something, then that person gets just blanketed with criticism for not being perfect. And I feel like that's the way that things have been going with Kamala Harris and with Donald Trump in uh, this campaign. And like one example is yesterday, Kamala Harris had this interview with Stephanie Rule. And the New York Times actually criticized her because she didn't show enough understanding of why people give Donald Trump credit for his stewardship of the economy. Like her job was supposed to be sitting there saints blaming away Donald Trump like they do. And if she's not doing that, then she blew her interview. And it's it's just an insane thing. Partly because Donald Trump did not shepherd the economy in any way shape or form he didn't he didn't the only real piece of legislation that affected the economy while he was president was giving billionaires tax cuts and sure you can sit there and go oh well yeah you know middle class got a 60 dollar a year tax credit too or whatever it was like they the the, the, the middle class got a technical tax credit for like a year and then it's all going to go away, you know. Um, he did not shepherd the economy. He just gave billionaires tax credits, and that added $2 trillion to the deficit. But Kamala Harris has to be explaining why he did such a good job on the economy when he did not do a good job on the economy. Even if you just look at the first three years, all he did was take credit for what Obama did. If you look at the... The, the pace of growth of the economy, of the GDP, while Trump was president, and you look at the last four years of Obama's presidency, there's no change. If anything, the economy slowed down. All he did was just ride the economy that Obama had already created until COVID came along. And then he gets credit here with, 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 with COVID being the reason that the economy collapsed, even though he's the reason that COVID hit the U.S. harder than any other country in the world. He did things like keep it a secret that it was airborne. He did things like tell people to inject cleaners or whatever it was. And, you know, the fact checkers are all going to be, he didn't say that. He would said it close enough. He, he definitely was talking about injecting household cleaners into your veins or something to get rid of COVID. Let's stop saying explaining away the things he said. No one ever recommended doing anything with household cleaners inside your body the way he suggested. But this is what he was doing. He was turning COVID into a one-man stand-up routine where he said stupid things and then just pretended to be the father of the country, shepherding the children into death. He, he ended the shutdown way too soon. It lasted like three weeks. These people acted like it lasted for three years. Um, but in most of the red states, it was gone before you could even say shut down. And it wasn't even a shutdown. It was just a, hey, stay at home if you don't have to go anywhere. And if you do go anywhere, can you just wear a mask while you're inside so that we can, you know, like stop the spread? And uh, the right wing nuttos had to go nutto about it. And he, actually made the problem worse with this kind of irresponsible rhetoric, which is why we had the worst death rate in the world from COVID. We had 
More people die from COVID than any other country. And he gets a pass on that. Like, nobody talks about this during this campaign. Everybody just talks about, oh, COVID's the only reason the jobs were lost. Well, no, COVID is not the only reason the jobs were lost. He's part of the reason that COVID was bad. It's just begging the question to say COVID is the only reason jobs were lost. Uh, but here we are with Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris having to explain away why he did such a great job on the economy or else she is not doing, you know, a good interview. Like, nobody ever criticized Donald Trump for not saying enough nice things about Kamala Harris. Uh, another thing. Let's go into the economy more. Uh, Donald Trump's economy, the what he... he So then let's talk about what happened, what's going on with the border. Uh, people act like Donald Trump did this great job at the border because he stopped people from coming in. First of all, I seem to remember four years of him ranting about caravans coming and invading the country. It was a national emergency the entire time he was president. But somehow, now we look back at it and we've memory hold all that, and we've just acted like he did this great job on the border, and not a single undocumented worker ever crossed the border while he was president. Because he was just so good, so adept at personally stopping people from crossing the border. When what he did is nothing to do with illegal immigration. What he did was ended legal asylum with this remain in Mexico policy that was absolutely a violation of human rights. And, you know, for those who don't know, asylum comes from 1949 after World War II, the UN looked at things and said, you know, there needs to be a way for people to leave a country where they're in danger. Because what happened is in World War II, a lot of Jews wanted to leave Germany, but they tried to go to another country and the other country would say, we don't want you here either and send them back to Germany. And then they would get killed by Hitler. So they're, they're after, the, uh, after World War II, the whole world got together and said, there has to be a way that if staying where you're at is going to kill you, you can leave. That seems like a pretty reasonable thing. And so they, they declared asylum a human right, the right to seek asylum. Now, in that, they also decided that just because somebody seeks asylum doesn't mean they have to be granted it. And so every country determines who they give asylum to. There's different laws, and uh, we have laws about asylum uh, that if, if you request asylum, you get a hearing. You get, you get to state your case before uh, an asylum officer or an immigration judge, depending on circumstances. It all gets complicated. But you have a right to state your case for asylum. And what Donald Trump did is he said, okay, you have to go to Mexico and wait for your asylum hearing. And there's some problems with that that are just really vicious. First of all, uh, like up to 80%, I think it is. I'll check the numbers on that. If I'm wrong, uh, I'll post it in a screenshot there. But a, a significant number of asylum seekers in Mexico are victims of violent crime. 
and they are very, very rarely solved. And this is in addition to the fact that people from Mexico are seeking asylum. So it's not like Mexico is a safe country. And people are like, well, what about the first safe country? And it's like, Mexico is not a safe country. It's just as dangerous as where they're, they're fleeing from. Uh, and so they have this human right. They have a right to ask for asylum. And when Donald Trump sent them to Mexico, he would, they would even move, do things like move the asylum hearing without telling them. So then they would miss their hearing, and then they'd say, see, they're not even really an asylum seeker because they missed their hearing. But they didn't miss their hearing because they didn't want to go to the hearing. They missed their hearing because the hearing got moved and they didn't get told. Uh, there's uh, also things like the child separation policy where if you came across with your family, then, you know, your children were, for lack of a better word, kidnapped and stolen from you, which was a deterrent. They, they did this on purpose to prevent people from trying to seek asylum. So this was like a violation of human rights. And it never gets talked about this way. It's always like, they were looking for a better life. You know, let me let me tell you a little story. Uh, an immigration lawyer told me he had a client whose mother. What, what there was a mother who was seeking asylum, and what happened is she was from one of the Central American countries where the gang violence is out of hand, and she said. Uh, what happened is her oldest son got sh got shot and killed because he wouldn't join the gang. And then at the funeral, the gang people came and sat beside behind her and her younger son. She had two sons, but was down to one. And they uh, they they put their little finger gun behind his head and pulled the imaginary trigger and told her that if her little garage grocery store business didn't double her taxes, he was going to die. So what she did is she went home and grabbed as much as she could and fled and came to America to seek asylum. Uh, if she stayed there, probably her younger son and herself would have died. Instead, her younger son was taken from her. So her choices were, have your son killed or have your son taken from you. This is the humane government that Donald Trump ran. Uh, it, was, it was insane. And Joe Biden, I have to admit, you know, there, there, there's, he, he's not very strong on the asylum issue either. But at least he's not that grotesquely brutal. At least he sees you know, immigrants as human beings. Uh, so this is this is Joe Bu or this is Donald Trump's border record was not a record of success. It was a record of denying people human rights. And we keep conflating undocumented workers or people coming across e illegally with asylum seekers. And asylum seekers are fleeing their country because they don't want to die. So, like, think of this. You're in a burning house, but you're under house arrest. Do you leave the house, even though it's illegal for you to leave the house? Would you rather leave the house illegally or burn to death? And if you say anything other than leave the house illegally, you're lying. Uh... And anybody that would say, no, you have to go back into the house is, is a monster. And it's just like, yes, there are reasons that people are seeking asylum. And it gets complicated because there's, 
it's not just one country or two countries or three countries. In fact, we have repatriated people to 170 countries around the world from every continent. And <coughs> there are a lot of reasons that people are seeking asylum. There are 56 unique conflicts around the world that people are fleeing from. And while you can sit there and say, we've got so many people that are coming across our border as though it's exclusively happening to us. But this is like, hear this, 120 million people around the world have are refugees right now. And just 12 years ago, it was 10 and a half million. And that's because of a number of things like the rise in authoritarian governments, things like climate change, and things like persecution of people for political, religious reasons, etc. And Donald Trump actually did a lot of things to exacerbate all three of those things by elevating despots uh, and by uh, removing the U.S. from certain agreements and by the, his little war on people that accept climate change is happening. So all of these things are getting worse in the large part because of Donald Trump. And it's like, you can say, well, he hasn't been president for four years. But it's not like everything happens on the U.S. presidential timeline. You know, if, 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 if I put uh, something in the oven and walk away and forget about it, and then two hours later, it all starts smoking, and my wife comes in, and she pulls it out of the oven, and it's almost on fire, then my wife is not responsible for that because she happened to be in the kitchen when it started smoking and, and nearly catching fire. She's not responsible for that. I am. And so what happened is Donald Trump did all of these things uh, that turned up the heat, and then when he was gone, everything started to catch fire. So a lot of things are still on him. You think that Ukraine didn't happen because of Donald Trump? Yeah, it did. He's the one that tried to weaken NATO. He's the one that tried to lift up Putin. He's the one that encouraged him. By the time Biden took office, Ukraine was a foregone conclusion. You don't think that Donald Trump is responsible for Gaza? He absolutely is. He's the one that decided to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, which was the, 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 the catalyst for the eventual war that we have now. So let's not be silly. Let's not just go, oh, well, you know, it's happening now, therefore it's Joe Biden's fault. This kind of post hoc logic that we have, the, oh, the economy was good for three years under Trump, but now it's bad. When it's actually better now than it was in 2019, but, you know, if you're just talking about inflation, then it's not independent of Trump. A lot of it has to do with the supply chain being broken down. And so it's just a basic thing about supply and demand. You don't have the computer chips. You don't have the cars. You don't, you don't have new cars. If you don't have new cars, then people that are buying cars are more likely to buy used cars. So there's fewer uh, new cars on the market with an increase in demand because COVID is coming to an end. So the price of new cars goes up. And since the price of new cars goes up, people buy used cars. And since you have more demand for used cars, but the same amount of supply, the price of used cars goes up. So then the price of cars go up. And it's like, it 
it happened while Joe Biden was president, but that doesn't mean it happened because Joe Biden was president. So that's another thing is the inflation that gets blamed on Biden, but it's actually much more complicated than that. And I wouldn't say it's entirely Donald Trump's fault, but Donald Trump certainly had a part in it because of his mishandling of COVID. And then finally, you know, like even with position changes, uh, Kamala Harris said like five years ago something about fracking. And, and how she wanted to stop fracking. But then now she's saying that she's not wanting to stop fracking. And so people are like, oh, well, that's a flip-flop. Well, there's a number of reasons for that. First of all, she had already previously in 2020 campaign said that she was okay with some fracking. But that's kind of not the point. It's like people learn things change. The fracking science has gotten better. Fracking is not as big of a deal right now, even if some of it is political and she's just trying to not lose Pennsylvania. Fine. We're not talking about like a major, major issue here. Uh, but with Donald Trump, he can take both sides of abortion in the same speech and nobody calls him out on his flip-flopping. He sits there and acts like, even though virtually everybody that wrote Project 2025 worked for him in some capacity, that he has nothing at all to do with it. It's totally distant from him. and But he can't say a single thing wrong with it. He just, oh, I had some issues with some things. But he doesn't say what it is. And the media doesn't, you know, the media asked Kamala Harris to explain, Kamala Harris, to explain her uh, position changes on fracking, but they don't ask Donald Trump to explain his differences on abortion that changed every six hours. So why is that? Again, it's because if they had to exp ask jo uh, Donald Trump every time he changed his position on something, why he changed his position on it, all they would be ever asking him is why he changed his position on something. Whatever Donald Trump thinks, whatever diarrhea thought comes out of his mouth at any given moment is just what he says. He doesn't think about things. He doesn't understand things. Even, even like tariffs, he doesn't understand how tariffs work. He says other countries pay for tariffs. And you see people in the media and people... Republicans that are trying to explain away what he meant and saying, well, sometimes tariffs are good. Joe Biden has tariffs. That's not the discussion. The discussion is who pays for tariffs. Yes, sometimes tariffs have a purpose and they have to be calculated and they have to be targeted and they have to be reasonable. Not just, oh, I'm going to put a 20% tax on the rest of the world and the rest of the world is going to pay for America. That's just dumb. It's not even... Like, dumb policy, it's just dumb, dumb thought. It's dumb. It's, it's an absolute lack of understanding of what tariffs are and how they work. And he has gotten less criticism for that than Kamala Harris has gotten for her flip-flop on fracking. And his entire approach to the economy is based on this wrong thought that other countries pay for tariffs. Other countries don't pay for tariffs. When a product comes in, the importer has to literally pay at the shipping yard before that product gets released. The importer pays the tariff, not another country. And then that importer sells it to a wholesale distributor at a markup that's a standard percentage. So if he pays a dollar for that to be imported and he has a 100% tariff, then he's going to mark that price up by 100%. But he's also got his own markup in there. So if he got it for 
a dollar and then he had a 50% markup, that means he was selling it to the wholesaler for $1.50. Then if the distributor uh, pays the tariff and it's 100%, then that $1.50, well, now he's got $2 he's paying. And then the the the... 50% markup makes it $3. So you, you can see how this adds up. And then the middle, the distributor that he sells it to has their markup. And then the, the uh, end client, you know, like Walmart or whatever, they have their markup. So by the time the end customer pays for it, it's a lot more than a $1 increase on the price. It's more like a $2 increase on the price. So what he's doing is, is guaranteeing inflation, which is why people are saying he will cause inflation. I mean, like actual economists are saying he's going to cause more inflation. But he doesn't have to explain that. He just says other countries pay for it. And then if anybody pushes back, he's like, yes, they do. But in the media, just, okay, he, he gets less criticism for a fundamental misunderstanding of how tariffs work than Kamala Harris gets for a slight change of position on fracking from five years ago. Um, then another example is this, this uh, cognitive dissonance or cognitive not cognitive dis uh, cognitive abilities where where Donald Trump gets away with just rambling nonsense about sharks and batteries and if a boat sinks then you would you rather be electrocuted by the battery or eaten by the shark you know and oh he was just joking about what what's what's the punchline there what what is the funny part like, he's trying to say what? Uh, that electric boats don't work? We have functioning electric boats that don't sink. He says, oh, they're too heavy. Uh, has he ever seen, like, a cruise ship? Like, no, the boat is not too heavy. It doesn't sink because of the battery. Actual engineers actually design things, and they know what they're doing. They know that if you put something in water, you have to make it so that the battery won't get wet and blow up or whatever. This is all nonsense. But you end up having these discussions with people trying to saints explain away what Trump did or what Trump said while they're nitpicking what Kamala Harris said. So this is what I mean when I say oh, so, so back to Joe Biden. You know, if you look at the first debate, if you just go and you look at the the transcripts of the debates. Joe Biden actually made a lot more sense than Donald Trump. Donald Trump was very confident, very brash, very bold, as he lied nonsense the whole time. And yes, Joe Biden mumbled and stammered and sometimes kind of went down a weird road and got lost. I'm not going to deny that. But if you look at the transcript, what he said was a lot more cognizant than what Donald Trump said. But we were looking more at how they said it than what they said. If you look at the actual content, Joe Biden was a lot more aware of what's going on around the world than Donald Trump is was. And, and, and yes, his delivery was terrible, but the actual content was not. Donald Trump, because he was bold and strong and full of confidence in his blabbering, you know, that made it okay. And this is another thing is about the whole media thing is that they, they, they get locked into a narrative and they refuse to let reality shape the narrative. And, and it's because they're trying to sell a horse race or because they're trying to be neutral, 
But what ends up happening is that the media has a huge pro-Trump bias by trying to not have a pro-liberal bias. But again, reality comes down to reality. And if what you end up talking about is anti-reality, then you've got an anti-bias. And when I see things like the New York Times today saying that Kamala Harris interview with Stephanie Rule was bad because she didn't say enough nice things about Trump's stewardship of the economy. It is just nuts. The, why does she have to explain away Trump's disastrous handling of the economy? He did not do anything for the economy. Can we please just stop with this myth that he was doing such a great job on the economy. He didn't do anything for the economy. The first four years of his presidency was live-tweeting Fox News. That's all he did as president. And then he'd go play golf. And we act like he was president or something. He held the office. He didn't do the job. And it's ridiculous that we pretend away anything else. What did he do? What did he do? What, what policy did he pass? What thing did he push for? Oh, the HBCU. No, he didn't have anything to do with that except for taking credit for it after he signed it, after it passed with a veto-proof majority in both houses, and after he had wanted to cut the funding before it even went through. And even though he paid less for the HBCUs, than either Obama or Biden. But we act like, oh, he's the great savior of HBCUs. He's not. We explain away things like, oh, he, you know, very fine people on both sides. And so there was like some magical, you know, that what they say is when he says, oh, there were very fine people on both sides, later on he said, I'm not talking about, you know, the white supremacists. And, and the Proud Boys, as though there was some magical third group of people there that were just honest, God-fearing, American, apple pie-eating people that were uh, really just, you know, they were just there to defend that statue and marching with people that were saying, Jews will not replace us, and they were fine with that. If they're fine with marching with people that are saying the Jews will not replace us. They are not very fine people. There is no third group. There were the white supremacists, and there were the people that weren't white supremacists. And if you weren't in the f people that weren't fine prim uh, white supremacists, then you are not a very fine people. White supremacists are not very fine people, even if they don't have an official white supremacist card in their wallet. And we do this thing to try and normalize Trump's insanity, normalize his racism, normalize calling immigrants vermin and like literally Hitler speak. And so now we're in this, in this state where, you know, it's a horse race. It should not be. And the media owns a huge part of it from their uh, both sides of everything, from their constantly trying to, if I criticize Trump, we also have to find a criticism of Kamala Harris. Even though Trump, the thing you're criticizing him for is he had 34 felony convictions, and Kamala Harris, McDonald's doesn't keep 45-year-old records of, you know, every single part-time franchise employee, so she must be lying about working at McDonald's, as though these two things in some way are equal, and they're not. So, uh, this, is, this is something you need to be aware of. As you're watching the news, just ask yourself, are these things equal? Are these things the same? Is Donald Trump getting less criticism for more severe things and Kamala Harris getting 
criticized more for more or less meaningless things just to even out the number of criticisms both people have. So anyway, uh, this was my inaugural uh, episode of uh, the, the Pun Show. Uh, thanks for listening. And again, if you liked it, click that subscribe button.